May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Well, good morning, pilgrims. I miss you. It's so nice to be back, but it's really weird to be preaching to an empty church. I kind of feel like I'm on one of those children's shows of like, and I see Johnny, and I see Susie. Anyway, speaking of children, there was once a Sunday school teacher who was teaching about Noah's Ark, and she asked her children, all right, what is it that's gray and furry and has a great big bushy tail and likes to eat acorns? And a kid says, well, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. We're going to be talking today about this idea that Jesus is everything. Um, and the verse that we're using comes from 1 Corinthians 6, where it says, You are not your own, you were bought with a price. There's another story. Um, this one comes from Corey Ten Boom, which is uh, told in one of my favorite books called The Hiding Place. She and her family hid Jews during World War II and were eventually sent away to a concentration camp for it. And she tells the story of one day um, at this concentration camp. She was there with her sister, and a, a new batch of prisoners had arrived. And her sister insisted that they give one of their blankets to one of these new arrivals. And Corey says, I, I gave her that blanket, but in my heart, I held on to it. I held on to the right to that blanket. And is it any wonder that joy and power imperceptibly started to drain from my ministry? Now, if you think about it, that's a bit of an odd story, isn't it? Because she wasn't really sinning. She intended to be obedient. But in her heart, she still held on to the right to it. And don't we do that with our lives? Not that we use things as an excuse to sin, but we're pretty convinced that we have a right to do as we please. You know, I'll, I'll tithe, but the rest of my money is mine. Uh, and I'll do Christian activities but then I have a right to do what I want to with the rest of my time. It's almost like we're giving God what we have to, but then we're kind of waiting to see what's left over for us afterwards. There's another story. This one comes from Genesis 4. Um, it says that Cain and Abel brought offerings to God. Um, and it says that Cain brought some of the fruits of the field, and Abel brought uh, fat portions from the best of his flock. Now, Cain wasn't really sinning by giving God some of what he had. It doesn't even say he gave the bad parts of what he had, the, the bruised fruit, the, the not as good stuff that he didn't really want. It just says he brought some. But Abel gave not just the best of what he had, he gave lifeblood. He understood that we're not called to give God some. We are called to give God us. And, of course, in the New Testament, who is compared to Abel? It's not a squirrel this time. This time it really is Jesus. But it, we see that happening in the other direction in the New Testament, where God is giving lifeblood for us. So something really important is going on here. This verse, in its original context, you are not your own, you were bought with the price, was written to the Corinthian church. Uh, Corinth was a port city. It was located on an isthmus, which is this narrow neck of land between two larger pieces of land. So it's actually got a harbor on both sides. So all of the wealth, all of the promiscuity that kind of is associated with port cities, that was Corinth times two. They were famous for the Isthmian Games, which were kind of a precursor to the Olympics. Um, they were famous for oratory. They were used to picking apart speeches by flashy looking people. They were a city built on the back of slave labor, convinced of their own importance and intelligence and right to do whatever they pleased. And that doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? The church was a mess, thank God, because otherwise Paul wouldn't have written so many useful things to them. Uh, it was a place where sexual ethics were kind of a new thing. Uh, it was a place where selfishness was really taking the place of love a lot of times. They had problems with divisions, problems with lawsuits. They were having people fighting for their rights. Their, uh, Paul actually quotes a letter of theirs saying, everything is permissible for me. You kind of get the sense that maybe the message of grace fit in a little too easily with their mindset. That they thought, great, 
God forgives me so I can keep on doing whatever I please, not realizing that grace and forgiveness imply that something isn't okay. So in a context where people were used to talking about their rights, Paul starts talking about God's right to expect holiness from them. And it wasn't based on a fear of punishment or of religious duty, which could have been valid things to say. It was based on what Jesus did and the value that he places on us. Uh, earlier in the chapter, Paul lists this big, long list of sins and then says, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the Lord Jesus. And then he starts building this case for sexual ethics, not based on this is what you have to do to be right with God, not based on because I said so. What he's saying here is so much more loving and all-encompassing than that. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's just about the most romantic thing I've ever heard, honestly, because what we're looking for in an intimate relationship is for someone to give themselves fully to us, to whom we can be safe giving ourselves fully. It's no accident that Paul said this to a city that was struggling with sexual ethics, because this is true intimacy, what we see here in this text. Christianity never claimed to be a philosophy. It claimed to be a report about a real person. So it's not about following a philosophy enough. It's not about being into it enough. It's about a real person coming and asking, what are you going to do with me? So I know that none of us have seen any similarities to Corinth. Um, but, but bear with me on the thought that perhaps we also have a lot of arrogance. Perhaps we also focus a lot on our rights, possibly because, like them, we're used to being in control. We control our agriculture with pesticides. We control so much of the economy. We control diseases with medicine. And in addition to feeling like we're in control all the time, we have this real crisis of authority where the buck stops with what I think. We define reality by what I think. We don't define what I think by reality. And unfortunately, this attitude even seeps into the church, but it is antithetical to Christianity. Because yes, God gave us minds and freedom, but when we do this, we are judging God by the standard of ourselves. When I am the ultimate authority, I'm worshiping me. There are a lot of people who say, well, I know people who live more Christian lives than Christians. That is nice, but it's not really the point. Because if I'm adopting principles because I like them, that still leaves me in charge. And it's not even really love, because if I'm accepting principles while rejecting the authority behind them, I'm still rejecting God. And this, I think, is why... Uh, the New Testament places such an emphasis on baptism because the, the way that somebody declares their allegiance to Christianity is not saying, I am a great person and therefore I'm deciding to adopt some of these nice teachings of Jesus. It's somebody publicly declaring, I don't have what it takes. I do need Jesus and I'm going to die and be resurrected with him right now. Like Corinth, Sometimes this is a spiritually dangerous area to live in because we're constantly told that we're in control and that we deserve to be. And we're not forced to reckon every day with Jesus being everything. We're not under persecution. We're not forced to choose him over everything else in every choice that we make. I'm not saying that it's bad to live an ordinary life because I don't know where God has called you. But wherever he has called you, you will not be prepared to answer his call if you're holding on to your right to live a normal life. Whatever you define that to be, think for a moment about what normal things you assume as rights. I should get to have a happy marriage. People shouldn't make me uncomfortable about my race or my privilege. I should get to have kids if I want them and not if I don't. I shouldn't have to deal with difficult people. 
I won't ever have to deal with a loved one having a catastrophic accident. I generally deserve to have people think well of me. None of these things is guaranteed. They're not guaranteed in real life anyway, but they're definitely not guaranteed in a relationship where we are called to give everything to the one who gave everything for us. So why is Jesus everything? Well, first of all, he's everything ontologically. Ontology is just a fancy philosophical word for it is what it is. It ha it's means by nature of who he is. So in John 5, Jesus calls God his father. And people complain because they say, well, that makes you equal to God. In John 10, he says, I and the Father are one. Again, people recognize what a radical thing he's saying and try to stone him. In Matthew 26, when he's on trial, he actually admits to saying that he was the Son of God, but he didn't couch it in terms of saying like, well, we're all God's children. He didn't try and reinterpret it in that way that made it more palatable for people. He actually took it farther and said, yes, I am the Son of God, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. He gave authoritative interpretations of the Torah. He didn't replace it, but he gave authoritative interpretations that were very different from the traditional interpretations of his day. He spoke with authority over sin and forgiveness, and he defended his right to do so. So by Jesus' own teaching, he saw himself as the authority. And either he was actually authoritative, or he was extremely arrogant. The way that a lot of Christians have phrased it over the years is that he was either a liar or a lunatic or the Lord. You know, he was, he was unholy or unhinged or he was right. Jesus is everything or nothing by his own teaching. He did not leave us room for anything else. The only thing that would be left would be to say that he is unholy or unhinged. But we've seen that a lot throughout history. We know what it looks like when a public figure is unholy and unhinged, and this is not what it looks like. Jesus is also everything relationally. He is worth it because we were worth it to him. Hebrews talks about how for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. You were the joy set before him, the joy of redeeming people, is what that joy was. So he believes that you are worth it. And he bought us with a price. And the Bible says repeatedly that this is the basis of his glory. Philippians 2 talks about how he humbled himself even to the point of death. Therefore, God exalted him. So relationally, because he considered you everything, he is everything to us. This is the basis of his glory. It's also the basis of our obedience. And finally, he's everything logically. If this story is true, if the living creator God took on human form and lived among us and was willingly betrayed and murdered and then was raised from the dead and said that that achieves reconciliation with him, not just now, but forever, that changes everything. I don't know if you've seen those cartoons where uh, somebody runs through a door that's too small for them and they just bust through the wall and leave a little self-shaped imprint in the wall. That is what Jesus did for death. He was too big for death and it broke because of that. That is permanently reality altering stuff. It is impossible to be a Christian and have a normal life because this is not a normal message. If this is real, it has to take over our lives. So what does it mean for Jesus to be everything in somebody's life. I'm not asking what it looks like because God's calling is gonna be different for each person, but what does it really mean? Well, first of all, it means that we have nothing to be afraid of. We don't live in an earthly reality, we live in the light of eternity. So there's really nothing that we have to be afraid of. It also means that God's interests are my interests. There's a story told um, of a pastor who was uh, being ministered to from Voice of the Martyrs. Um, and they, they got a letter for him that said, you know, thank you, I really appreciate all the outpourings of support and prayers and letters, but please stop praying for my release. 
I'm having such a fruitful ministry here in prison. Please stop praying for my release. What if our lives being turned upside down right now by this pandemic meant that it's a perfect time to let God rearrange our priorities and show the world what trust and care for our neighbor look like? What if someone being a jerk to you is a perfect opportunity to surprise them with God's love? What if the race conversation that makes so many of us so uncomfortable is the perfect opportunity to learn how to love our neighbors in a way that really means something to them? Our answers to these situations are going to be very different depending on whether it's my life or if I'm in the kind of relationship with Jesus where it's our life and my intent is always God's kingdom. Jesus being everything also means that we are free. We don't have to hide our sin because God's grace is glorified when people see sinners forgiven. And it's about Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 says, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ. So it means that we are free and don't have to hide. It also means that Jesus gets to define us. Now, this is a really challenging thing for our culture since we are so about self-definition, but it's also extremely good news. For many of us, the current events that are going on really mess with our sense of identity. For many of us, uh, the pandemic put us out of work and we can't find our value or our, or our identity in our work anymore. For a lot of us, uh, the race conversation means that there is tons of pain coming up. No matter what race you are, there is a ton of pain coming up for people of all races as everyone deals with the fact that people have been trying to tell us not just who we are, but what's in our hearts. When our allegiance is to Jesus, it means that we are not defined by our work or by people's labels and expectations or even by the sins that legitimately get pointed out to us. You are defined by the grace of Jesus and there is nothing and nobody else that has the authority to define you. Jesus being everything also means that we're not the ones making things happen. Corey Ten Boom goes on with her story later to talk about when Joy came back into her ministry and it was in reading about Paul's thorn in the flesh and suddenly realizing that her mistake wasn't her little acts of selfishness along the way. Her mistake was thinking that any of the power for her ministry, any of the things that she was doing, came from herself. Finally, Jesus being everything means that you belong. I, uh, I just read a funny little quote in Reader's Digest that said, if lobsters knew how expensive they were, they'd be proud. And I thought, that is really true about us. You know, we live in a culture that really, really values independence, and we're also the loneliest generation in history, we know instinctively that somebody wanting you confers a value upon you. That's why teenagers get so hung up on being asked out by somebody, because we realize that somebody saying, I want you to be with me, I want you to belong with me, confers much more value on them than just saying, Okay, go off and be independent. The fact that Jesus wants you means that you are infinitely valuable. And the fact that you belong to Jesus means that you belong. Here's what I am not saying with all of this. When I say Jesus is everything, I do not mean that your life only matters if it's dramatic. God calls a lot of us to very ordinary looking lives and very small, beautiful acts of love. I am not saying you need to add more to your life because once again, often that's me trying to appease God and hoping I have something left over afterwards and not something that's God asking, that God is asking of me. Sometimes, rather embarrassingly, God is actually asking us to do less. There is no glory in observing the Sabbath but that is what God calls us to because it is about Jesus and it is about the relationship that he wants with us and the value that he places on us. I am not, by saying that Jesus is everything, saying that you need to go do foreign missions. You are strategically placed where you are. God may call you to do foreign missions or he may say, 
Exactly where I put you is exactly where I want you. I am not saying that every moment is an opportunity to hand out a gospel tract. That is not what Jesus is everything means. It does not mean that you always have to be on. And it does not mean that you need to completely overhaul your life right now. I say this because I know there are people out there like me who hear something like this and go, oh no, I'm doing everything wrong. Just the fact that you're listening to this sermon means the chances are really high that you're already trying to follow Jesus. I know that, God knows that, this is not saying that you need to completely overhaul your life. You know what God is really asking here? It's a really simple thing that Peter wrote to us. He says, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. It's so simple, but deciding now that Jesus is Lord is what, is what will prepare you to act in the moment like Jesus is Lord. You know the other thing that prepares you is fixing your eyes on Jesus? Just think about him. Make a habit of thinking about him. Because asking, do I have what it takes to give everything to Jesus? Am I giving everything to Jesus? Is about as useful as asking, have I studied enough for this exam instead of cracking open a book? Think about why Jesus is worth it. Think about his love for you. That's what will prepare you. Become convinced that God loves you. That's what will prepare you. I once asked a friend, how do you hear from God so well? Because he just, he seemed to hear from God really well. Um, and I was really surprised when he said, um, I meditate on his love for me, not just his love in the abstract, but for me personally. Why is that what prepares you? Why is that what helps you hear from God? It's because knowing his love means that we don't have to be in control. We don't have to seek fulfillment in sin. It means that we're enabled to love others. Without the love of God, this whole you are not your own thing does not make sense. Just as without love, the crazy demands of marriage to put somebody else first, to stick with through them with whatever may happen, to give yourself so fully to them that it changes your identity, makes absolutely no sense. Without love, it makes no sense. But with the love of God, this verse not only makes sense, it makes sense of everything else. Under no other circumstances would it make sense that it's in him rather than independence that we find freedom, and that it's here that we find the passion in life that we long for and the intimacy that we've been seeking. Jesus is everything because you are everything to him.